and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome to Irreverent, a postmodern conspiracy freak show for mm. our times with me, Jamie Franklin, and today I'm joined by the Reverend Daniel French. Daniel, how's it going? It's going fine. Now, the door behind me will not open with Bill Gates. Oh, yeah, well, that's saying, the good thing. Oh, I just happened to be here. I in... just happened to be standing around and here. here. In Ready white, to solve white all your problems. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Danny, my, my problem solving will be as good as my software. <laughs> Lord yeah. help us, uh, yeah. laser. I, Indeed, indeed. So, Daniel, uh, we're we're vicars in the Church of England, aren't we? Um, vicars with a difference, though. I would say, yeah. mostly, mostly speaking, there are there are vicars like us, but I don't know. Are there? Are there though? I don't know. I'm not sure. I know, we, that that might we... be a bit prideful to say during Lent. It may be, yeah. We should we should display appropriate contrition. Mm-hmm. Um, but welcome to the podcast, everyone. Particularly if you're new, that's, it's like being in a church, isn't it? If you're new, you're you're very very welcome. If you're just if you just coming again, then it's great. It's great that you're here. Uh, we're going to talk about some interesting stuff today. All the big news stories plus roundup mm-hmm. of all the things that are happening in the Church of England, and there are quite a lot of things happening in the Church of England. Not necessarily always drama. Things, but, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, drama. Not necessarily positive. Things, always giving. But, Treasuring yeah, exactly. is always giving, isn't it? Always giving. Exactly, exactly. A number of people have asked us to comment on the the Asbury revival as well, which I'm looking forward to talking about because I do have quite a few thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, but first, Daniel, uh, I wanted to congratulate you on your interview in uh, Sphere Fitzo. Yeah, how, so, how do you... Paul, well, think, help us out. How do you pronounce this? I think it's Sphere Fitzo. But I always... But the, the thing is, at the beginning, there's a P, so it makes me want to say Pse. Pse yeah. Fitzo. Pse it's just really hard to pronounce. Anyway, it's it's in Paul's blog. Ian Paul is a well-known Christian blogger, and he granted you an interview. Daniel, how did the interview? Was it a a, um, a written interview or? It was a written interview. Yeah, and it was done on the back of. Um, it's you're to blame because right. he watched you on the Jeremy Vine show, uh, and oh, yes, started with, with Jane uh, Ozan. With Jane Ozan, started yeah. uh, direct messaging me on Twitter. Nice. Uh, commenting that you know. This chap's really good. How have I not heard of him? And <laughs> he, 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 I've met him several times. He's yeah. in the same deanery as me. So um, I don't know. But uh, uh, anyway, um, uh, that's where it got from. You know, yep. tell me more about the podcast. And he sent me within minutes, uh, super fast, actually, email came to me with a load of um, questions. And yeah. Um, I went away and answered them. You and responded. You and um, yeah, that's gone up on Facebook as well and uh, Twitter uh, where it's been shared. And there's been um, lots of um, lively comments. Yeah, yeah. So to, um, um, all sides of the Church of England. Yeah, indeed. And indeed. None. All faiths and none have responded. All, all faiths and none within the Church of England have uh, responded um it's a really good it's really interesting uh interview i did the the the, what i said at the beginning uh, was actually a quotation when i described a reverend as a postmodern conspiracy freak show from something you said in the article about some um harsh feedback we got from a from a fellow Mm. um anglican priest i actually tweeted that out on our account and said uh quoted you saying Mm. that we'd been called in uh, a postmodern conspiracy freak show and i i just said but is that a bad thing and i think that that you know question I think that question just can go out there, can't it, Daniel? Is it yeah. a bad thing to be a postmodern conspiracy freak show? Um, and and do, do, does postmodernism does it actually even um, is it congruent with conspiracy theory type thinking? I'm not really hmm. sure. You'd have to think about how those how does how does the postmodern the kind of post truth hmm. go with the conspiracy mindset? I don't know. I don't know. Not really sure about that. Is yeah, it? Like, I, oh, oh, is it? Is it? Is it that they're saying that like we're being postmodern by sort of saying, oh, you know, well, uh, you know, there's, you know, viruses are just, you know, subjective. You know, maybe there's a virus, maybe there's not. You know, climate change. Who really knows what even is the climate? Blah blah blah. And so, so we're saying that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we're saying 
uh, and these people, are, you know, these people are kind of conspiring to 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 uh, enslave us to this kind of, you know, this narrative truth, which can't possibly be assailed. But we are assailing it with our kind of postmodern deconstruction, not only of the narrative, but of the very notion of truth itself. Maybe maybe it's that, Daniel. Well, I think the accusation is that we're tickling uh, vulnerable, red pilled people you know uh, tickling vulnerable but, ears you know and um uh riding on the the back of that i think that we're, that's we're riding on the back act. of vulnerable people and tickling their ears at the same time as they download mm. our podcast and increase our stats mm. um interesting i just yeah and, and there were uh, there were you know sort of unmodern yes or, or no, what, what was the accusation against the wesleyans isn't it that they were uh, the um that they were enthusiastic yeah yeah well well i'm very enthusiastic i think enthusiasm is the best thing you know it's 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 literally to be filled with the spirit of god you know that's we know in the 18th means. century it was a slight wasn't it to say that well, you were enthusiastic you know, it's a, that was it, you know it's a serious it all mistake. too seriously yeah well it's a ser- from an etymological perspective it's a serious mistake to call someone enthusiastic as an insult because it means to be filled with the spirit of god uh, uh, conversely to be apathetic means to be without pathos it means to be without passion without mm. without emotion so that's not that's not mm. uh, an insult i i want to be enthusiastic the worst thing is to feel not enthusiastic and to be you know in a kind of um what's what's the other word a kind of uh, torpor or mm. uh, ennui uh, but but the other thing because about... it leads to a cedia, you know the great yes yeah that's the something great vice, uh... isn't it where where you mm. end up losing the will to mm. carry on in your vocation yes charles taylor talks about that i read mm. a book about charles taylor by the way just just i don't talk about it very much but is it, it's available on amazon <laughs> yeah the price is actually it's it should be on the merch the merch yeah um, we could surprisingly cheap now i think it's gone down to about 75 mm. quid anyway um but no we're not postmodern, really are we daniel i think i would i would prefer to think of myself as pre-modern than postmodern. i mean it seems a bit strange it seems a strange um strange insult for us anyway uh, you know uh, i would i would expect people to call us like you know um backwards um you know sort of uh bigoted people who belong in the middle ages or in the dark ages or something like that yeah, not, we not don't all. tend to i've noticed we don't tend to get the accusation of being fundamentalists it's yeah. more medieval well it's very medieval isn't it yeah. Um, you might you might have noticed on twitter i had a a series of exchanges over uh, whether Christ is really a saviour, um, uh, right. uh, all, all around inclusive church, which is a um, uh, a movement, it's a it's a, a lobby group movement within the Church of England. Uh, about oh yeah, what, they were saying they were universalists. Weren't yes, they? yeah. I mean, I just commented on it rather than actually got into the exchange. Yeah. Various others did better than than I could have on on that. But um, uh, you know, I, I was struck by the accusation is oh well that's very medieval isn't it to believe in yeah and uh it, it prompted me to think of c.s lewis's posthumous book discarded images where in well, i think one of the lectures he was asked by a student are you a medievalist and he said no i'm not a medievalist i am medieval right yeah well he was he was um he had the right perspective on things for sure no that he inhabits he said i inhabit that world yeah, and uh, I inhabit an enchanted, beautiful world that keeps me happy and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that lightens my spirit. And you don't. Yeah, contrary. Um, that, yeah. That, um, yeah, but, I've um, just um, I've just read a, a really good book about C.S. Lewis by uh, um, an American academic called Jason Baxter. It's called The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, and it's precisely about this topic. It's fantastic. It really is a fantastic book. I've got one by uh, Armstrong from Duke University. All right, which um, is a series of his lectures to which were oversubscribed about how to, how to think like a medievalist, and he said that all these. Um, people from uh, quite strict reformed protestant ba- backgrounds were just crowding in because yeah. they they can't get enough of it yeah uh, uh you know we are um in an age where, where we have to rediscover our the mystical spiritual depths of our faith yes and it's clear that when you you know like rod dresses when you go in somewhere like chartres cathedral you cannot but be affected um by that by the aesthetic well you know all about the aesthetics of the church uh, mm. 
um, because there's a book that might soon be available on the um, uh, on the merch for seventy five. Yeah, pounds. that's that's something that is in the book. The book that I wrote, yeah. which I never talk about, is also about aesthetics. So it's about Charles um, Taylor and aesthetics. Yes. That's yeah, there, there is a poverty of aesthetic, uh, mm. and um, th this can be one of the one of the things that one of the weapons of our evangelization mm. is you know, creating a, a beautiful culture, even within what little spheres we have. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Just to go back to that Twitter thing, because it was quite funny, I was yeah. following it. So so they're a lobby group, Inclusive Church are a lobby group within the Church of England, right? So, uh, and, and, and somehow they, I can't quite remember, but they disclosed whoever was controlling the Twitter account basically implied that it was wrong to have anything but a universalist view. So anyone who, for people who don't know what that means, a universalist view is basically the view that all religions and, and basically all all human life leads ultimately to to union with God. So there's no all paths go up the same mountain. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no sort of there's no judgment or anything like that. And then somebody said, um, so is this the official view of inclusive church? And the person obviously panicked because then it turned out it was a, a woman. Um, uh, she said, no, this is just my personal opinion. I just happened to be using the inclusive church pod, um, uh, Twitter account. And so they, and then the, and then there was this back and forth about, well, don't you think it's slightly confusing to tweet your personal opinions um, through an official account for inclusive church because it makes it look like this is a cl inclusive church's official position i mean don't you see a problem with that so there's this kind of quite amusing it was it was obviously it was obviously slight i think there was a bit of panic there on the part of the person who's tweeting on behalf of inclusive church but her own opinion about mm -hmm. universalism uh so the the actual position daniel of inclusive church on the question of universalism uh, remains a mystery i mean what do they you know what do they think it, it really it's hard to say isn't it because uh, they and, and this is they the, have this is, unofficial opinions going out as that conversation went on then it became oh well, you know this is a pylon oh we know we're, we're being um subjected to people's abuse uh, yeah theological yeah. abuse and, and and actually there wasn't an enormous amount of people participating in this i mean i think half a dozen if that so i think they just wanted some clarity didn't they uh, and, and you know so, so then there's sort of it's so easy what often what happens with the um, progressive side of of both Christianity and politics is it goes to these ad hominem attacks. You know, mm. well, you're a medievalist, or that's a horrible, you must be a horrible person if you believe such and such, rather than actually answer answer the damn question. Mm. Yeah, just Do you believe in universalism because this has consequences? Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. And, 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 and you know, it, I mean, it also has consequences for you if you're a if you're an Anglican, if you're in the Church of England, because, you know, this is obviously something we've been talking about with the same sex thing is that as an Anglican, particularly if you're ordained, you swear to uphold certain formularies in the church. And if you believe things and, and espouse them publicly, which contradict those formularies, then that could be said to be quite um, a significant, significant issue. Um, anyway, Daniel, let's do some. Should we do some scripture? Mm. Um, speaking of the need to uphold our formularies, uh, I thought it'd be good if we could read a classic Lenten text today. So it, the day we're recording is Ash Wednesday. Most people will get this a couple of days after Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent when you traditionally uh, are ashed. Um, not not the easiest verb to use in a sentence, but uh, mm, being yeah. ashed is... is um, yeah, here it is. You've got your ash. ash. It's not, yeah, See, it's ash. Now, now that the... Um, now that the the diocese have kindly given me a wood burner, mm. it's not exactly his net zero formularies, but um, it's lovely being able to um, burn burn things. And yeah. the tradition is to burn palm crosses yeah. to make the ash. So uh, I had a go at that last night in the fire, put a, put a load in, and I showed the children at school assembly. Nice. And then what you do is you get ash on your forehead, mm. normally in the shape of a cross. A slight bit here. So, yeah, I can't uh, actually see it today. It must have faded. My, I, I'm getting ash later. I think I'll be ashing myself because I'm doing the service. But in some traditions, you actually um, sprinkle a little bit of ash on people mm. on your head. But anyway, ash, ash is um, being ashed is a sign of you know contrition and repentance, which is what Lent is all about. So let's mm. um, read. Um, from Joel, the prophet Joel, chapter two. 
And this is the seven verses, but I'll read it, you know, reasonably swiftly so that it doesn't take ages. Um, and we'll say the rules prayer first. I'll do it this week, Daniel. Uh, right. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, Joel, chapter 12. That's not chapter 12, chapter 2, verse 12. There are only three chapters. <laughs> I know, it's not that. It's not a long book. All right, uh, here we go. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room in the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord. And make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will make, I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. So there we are. It's a classic ten text, and it's it's um, it's used on Ash Wednesday in particular um, for reasons <clears throat> uh, which are quite clear when we consider the meaning of Lent. Uh, mm -hmm. Lent is all about um, it's all about returning to the Lord. The way I sort of think about it, Daniel, is it's about sort of refocusing our attention on the on the Lord um, through practices like fasting renouncing things taking other things up you know prayer uh, bible study it differs from person to person and also uh, practices to do with alms giving as well but the whole point of it is to make a kind of return to the lord um particularly with reference to uh, contrition and repentance so uh, you've got all these elements in in the text here uh, there's an individual aspect to lent where we do these things privately and as individuals but we also do them corporately as well as we see here when um a solemn assembly is called gather the people consecrate the congregation assemble the el elders etc um and i think the thing that sort of particularly struck me about this passage just reading it through is this sort of narrative of repentance and blessing which obviously runs through particularly through through the old testament through the prophets and everything like that but it's as the, as the people repent and ask God to have mercy, then God shows himself to be gracious and loving and to leave a blessing behind him, as it says here. Um, here we've got the priests weeping, saying, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach. Uh, feels very relevant uh, for us at this time in the Church of England. Um, we as uh, priests and uh, bishops i think you know we really should be um considering this issue of repentance very very seriously and then we see of course god's blessing when when that attitude of contrition and repentance is is taken seriously by people by priests by uh the the assembly the congregation uh, which we can interpret as the church in our time so yeah it's very very relevant stuff isn't it daniel mm. and and i think it's it's much more multifaceted than the um, uh, than than these acts of corporate repentance and reparation mm. that have become very fashionable at the at the moment. Because I think this what what the Bible does in in some ways it's very shy of the whole idea of social justice. You know that justice is for each man and woman it cuts through each mm. individual's heart as well as yes you know the the nation can get it completely wrong mm. and can go 
wonky and become apostate uh, and deserve the punishments of God. Mm. Um, in the end, it, it does come down also to what each of us has and hasn't done. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think, do you, do you know what I mean? That the, yeah, the, do, yeah, yeah. There, there's a, a, a tendency at the moment to sit very comfortably um, on, say, um, you know, historic, let's say, historical misdemeanors and injustices from like two, three hundred years ago and say, oh, well, you know, I'm going we're going to do reparation for this. Um, and in the same breath, really sit very lightly on your own sins yeah absolutely uh you know it was one of those things that um it, uh george orwell i think it shocked him in in his uh various ad time out living in poverty living with coal miners living in paris that when on his return he found that most of his bourgeois friends actually didn't really care much that he'd actually had done all of this and tried to live a life of solidarity with those who are on the, the bottom of society because they largely just hated the rich mm. yeah. yeah i think it's road to wigan pier isn't it and uh, letters from paris yeah. from I've, I've read down and out that? of Paris in London. Down and out of Paris, yeah. Yeah, I've not I've not read. In fact, Red Twig and Pier is on my reading list for this year, actually. So um yeah, mm. I look forward yeah, to it. Yeah, and I think what what Prophet Joel is 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 inviting us is we yes, we come together corporately, but we can't we we can't not in the corporate, the danger is hiding our sins away you know i yeah. mean you can get this almost to some extent i think it's one of the weaknesses of the um current anglican usage of the penitential rite is you can sleepwalk through the whole um corporate penit penitentials yeah so, uh, and, so, so they, and, and while the while the priest is you know saying i absolve you from all your sins to everyone you know you're sitting there thinking i wonder what temperature i've got to put the turkey on later on you know yeah. um and you, you're just sort of oh it's just this is a boring bit for a few minutes where we yeah yeah we've done bad things and so, well whatever mm. but, yeah no. yeah well this is um i know this is not you know this is not necessarily anyone's everyone's tradition who's who's listening to this but this is why i think sacramental confession is so powerful i mean even if you don't believe in it i mean obviously i do but even if you don't really believe in it the actual psychological process and spiritual process of thinking through your own sins as an individual and confessing them, you know writing them down and confessing them out loud is actually a profoundly um beautiful and liberating experience it's difficult it's not an easy thing to do at all it's very hard actually it takes a lot of courage to do it but it is a it's a wonderful thing and as you take that individual responsibility for your sin and you bring it into the light before god um i've had some you know personally uh, and as a penitent and as a priest I've had some mm. incredibly powerful experiences um mm. in in uh in in confession for that reason and, and you're quite right daniel i think the um i think the whole thing of you know well you know we need to repent on behalf of groups of people who did certain things in the past who we might be associated with i just don't really think that's i just don't really think that's what repentance is mm. um repentance is about being sorry for your own sin and and there is a corporate element to it obviously like we see here there's a, there's a corporate element but the corporate element is about an ongoing thing that we as a people are, are doing I mean, I feel that way about what's going on at the Church of England. I think that what we're doing as a, as a church is wrong um, mm. in terms of the, the same-sex blessing stuff. And I think we as a people need to repent. Um, now, I'm I'm doing my very best not to sort of be implicated in this sin personally, but in a way I am because I'm part of this church, you know. So you can't, you can't say yeah. there's no sort of corporate reality at all, but the relationship that corporate personality has with us as individuals is quite complicated i think going back to what you just said about the the practice of confession within the within the church and particularly if i know as we said it's not everybody's tradition within anglicanism um though there, there's elements of that isn't there in uh the evangelical and charismatic that there, there is an element in which you know actually maybe as part of your witness even 
uh, admitting your faults publicly, mm. um, if not privately, can be a very powerful thing with some sort of prayer ministry uh, on w- within that. Um, I think it's a, it's a real shame that that this ministry is is barely used within the, mm. within, the within the C of E, and I don't know why that 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 is. I mean, maybe it's just because of you know, historical. Uh, historical apathy to doing something which might seem very Romish, um, but it is an enormous release, you know, and, and we are charged as clergy to, to, you know, to unbind people. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I can't but underline the, the, uh, um, the seriousness and the joy of that. And mm-hmm. it's a it's a rare ministry within my own context, my own parish here. But when it has been done, it is it's been profound. And I wish more I wish more people would uh, you know take courage to to do to do that. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the um and, and the second thing I wanted to say is it, yeah. in in the catechism that I'm writing at the moment you know i open up with the idea that the which i think many of our listeners will be sympathetic to that the system is broken or the system is out to get you mm. yeah you know, that the, the machine wants to swallow you up and make you into a cog but that's not where the church i think that you know the, the church in its orthodoxy asks us to remain mm. oh i'm just a victim of the system because conversely the other side of the coin is you and I and all of us are responsible for it. Mm. You know, we have we are complicit in the sin that has got us into a, the place uh, of where we are. Yeah. And I think that you see in the history of Israel, don't you? That mm. that the prophets get that right. The system's broken, but you, everyone here, is actually part of that problem. Mm. It's not just Bill Gates, you know, because I was Bill Gates and it's it's Klaus Schwab and all of that, the baddies. Each of us has to look into our hearts and say, I'm part of the problem. And mm. I need to actually, within myself, you know, get my own stuff in order with God. Mm. Yes, I agree, Daniel. So I better shut up, otherwise I'll start doing um a George <laughs> Peterson. Get no. your room in order. No, no. Well, see. Oh, yeah, seeing as you did, seeing as you mentioned Bill Gates, uh, Daniel, I think it's probably time for us to go for twits on Twitter. Now, oh. um, now this is an audio. This is always audio because I don't really know what happens when you. Well, I mean, should we try? Should we try, Daniel? Why don't we try and 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 share it um, on video as well and see what happens? It's only short. we're not using one of his software platforms, are we? Hang on a second. So here we go. So we're going to watch this now. So I don't know if this works on YouTube or whether this is totally screwing everything up. But um, this is our Twitch on Twitter. And this is Grant Shapps, who is, what is he now? I can't even remember what he is. He's something in the government. Something in the cabinet, yeah. Let's hang on a second. People are seeing all my my. Seems to get a different job every month. Uh, This person's tweeted and said, a demon lurks in the background. Grant Shapps is either an idiot, completely divorced from reality or both. And um, and then... (laughs) He's written, Bill Gates is one of the most hated men on the planet, but paraded by our political elite as a demigod. So to explain what that means, let's watch the video. Here we go. Well, as you know, I've just taken over the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. I didn't know that, clearly. So he's just taken over the Department of Energy. What was it? Energy Security and Net Zero. Those two (laughs) things seem to contradict each other to me. but (laughs) Nevertheless, here we go. Security and net zero, one of the most important things is to do the transition. One of the most important things is to do the transition. You you would have thought he'd he'd know how to use um, English grammar, wouldn't you? But um, to do the transition, uh, here we go. Let's stop now. Transition. And what better way to get a hand, helping hand on this, than with this gentleman? And then he pans round. For people who aren't watching this, which might be everyone, and standing behind him, next to some crappy banner with Imperial College London written on it, is Bill Gates, who's wearing a a, a tie which is just way too big. I mean, it's just massively long and broad, mm. and he's smiling malevolently. <laughs> it, it's a bit. He's almost become a Simpsons caricature of himself, hasn't he? Really? yeah he has he has it's crazy <laughs> so what better way than to get the help of this guy right here who's got nothing to do with the he just happened to drop in he's an american he's just hanging around somewhere 
with a, next to a banner saying Imperial College London. Yeah, largest farm land owner in the world. Just in the world. To drop in. Buying up farmland, yeah. buying up cattle. Just doing a bit of shopping in Harrods and thought, well, I'll just drop in. I just happen to be here. Let's let's listen to what Bill, Bill Gates has got to say. Uh, I have to always take it back. With this gentleman right here. Hey, Bill, how are you doing? Hey, great to be meeting with you. <laughs> he doesn't sound very confident, does he? Like, hey, great to be meeting with you. And you too as well, says Grant Shapps. And you too as well. We are going to be discussing this uh, end of break, the, the way to uh, transition the entire world to uh, net zero. Wow. They're going to, they're talking about how to transition the entire world to net zero, Daniel. That's, yeah, that's, that's I think amazing. Grant needs to just, Mr. Shap, sorry, needs to just concentrate on the UK. Yeah, probably um, best, probably just best start, start local. Yeah. Did you, you know. know, did you know, Daniel, I read, a, I read, um, a really interesting fact the other day, which is that um, the internet takes the same amount of energy as all air travel. Mm-hmm. Did you know that? So the internet takes a, consumes a massive amount of energy, and yet nobody ever talks about it. And before reading that, I'd never even considered it. But nobody's going on about how we need to shut down the internet, are they? Yet, that could be the next thing, I suppose. Well, we of course, shut- the problem is, is that you see all Microsoft products are now on the cloud. Mm. Whereas before you used to get them on a CD ROM, now yeah, yeah. it's uh, real time. Yeah, so well, you pay constantly hooked to the carbon hungry internet. Mm. Yes, it's munching up. The internet's munching up all the carbon, Bill. Mm. Give are- us, give us word for free, Bill. Yeah, exactly. I have to pay five pounds a month. I need word as well because I, I need yeah, a, uh, a word. Yeah, I hate something. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I have to keep on taking this. Uh, net zero. Uh, Fantastic, says Bill Gates. Well, there we go. I'm going to stop that screen share now. I'm not even sure if that works. And I'm not sure if the audio worked either. So we'll see. It's a bit of an experiment. Apologies mm-hmm. if it didn't work. But basically, Grant Shapps, who, Grant Shapps, who is the, what was it? Was the energy security and net zero man, mm-hmm. um, is meeting with Bill Gates in Imperial College London, Presumably, presumably they're not just they just don't just carry around a, a banner with Imperial College London written on it uh, to talk about uh, how to have net zero, so no carbon anywhere in the whole world, but still have clean, reliable, and uh, cheap energy. It's not going to happen, Grant. I think you're living in a fantasy world. Personally, I don't know what you think, Daniel. Well, I, I, I don't, I haven't yet seen all these people protesting outside the Chinese embassy, mm. considering the amount of coal that China is burning. And I think it's had more carbon emissions in the last 10 years than we've done since the industrial revolution, you know, that, that our input into mm. um, fossil fuel use puts us, you know, at, at a kind of 1% yeah, of um, global up. usage. Whereas, you know, China is now the biggest. So is Bill how how's Bill gonna solve that problem of net zero without China or India or Russia? You know, and I think Latin America is quite big as well now, you know. So um um it, maybe he'll maybe he'll pop up in a Twitter video made by Xi Jinping. We'll just be somehow <laughs> just standing I, around. Yeah. Somehow I doubt it. Yeah. You know, the thing about the internet, just to go back to that for a minute, I guess the reason they're not talking about shutting down the internet is because the internet is their way of getting us all to stay in our houses, isn't it? Because then, you know, we can do things like this and not actually go out and meet people and we could just live online. Whereas if they started saying, oh, we've got to shut down the internet, then people would start saying, well, then you have to let us, us use our cars because we need to actually go places now to buy food and, um, you know, meet people. But the internet, you know, they want to they want to keep us they want to keep us here, even though the internet is is um, producing as much energy as all air travel, Daniel, all air travel globally. That's what I read. I read Mister Gates has quite an interesting portfolio in private jets. I think it's about two hundred million pounds or Ooh. dollars worth. And um, well, there uh, we go. But you know, the danger there is you end up like in the old Soviet system, isn't it, where the mm. elites had their own. <laughs> Had their own chauffeur-driven cars and and their their own lanes on the on the yeah. driveways through the cities because they they had to you know they were important they had to get to their meetings and their yeah day homes 
quicker than the rest of us and they have they yeah they have to talk to they have to theorize and and go to think tanks and meet with important people to talk about how to transition everyone to to net zero so overall their contribution will be positive because even though they are producing massive amounts of carbon for an individual person the overall work they're doing is so valuable that you know the overall carbon emissions will go down so he's got every right to do it daniel uh moving on let's uh listen to one thing here here he is this is um vladimir putin he's talking about the west their prime target is younger people and our young generation and here again they lie constantly they distort historical facts they constantly attack our culture the russian orthodox church and other traditional religious organizations of our country look what they do with their own people the destruction and promotion of the family cultural and national identity perversion abuse of children even pedophilia are declared i'm reading a bit quicker than he's talking the norm the norm of their way of life i'd like to say this, say to them look at the holy scripture the holy books of all other world religions it's all there including the fact that the family is the union of a man and a woman lots of um, orthodox patriarchs and things there he's about to make a comment about the church of england but even those sacred texts are being reviewed now as it became known, the Anglican Church, for example, plans to, just plans at this point, to consider the idea of a gender-neutral God. What can I say? May God forgive them, they know not what they do. I mean, he, he sort of raises his hands in a comical gesture when he does that, as if to say, you know, can't believe what they're, I can't believe what they're doing, but... It's pretty... extraordinary to think he's reading the Church Times. Isn't I it? know, I know. <laughs> Thinking it gets delivered. Oh my God. I know. It's crazy, isn't it, that he was? Yeah. Um, but it just shows you, you know, the the implications of what we're doing as a communion. You know, with that gender neutral nonsense and and with the the same sex blessing thing, it has global ramifications. Um, uh, well, in in the sense that he's kind of mocking the Church of England, you know, and um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I have very mixed feelings about this. You know, th this this guy is clearly, you know, a psychopath in, on so many levels. And I think the Orthodox Church in trying to, or, or the patriarchs of, of Russia, you know, in, in spiritualizing potentially World War Three, you know, have have uh, enormous issues, mm. um, you know, and have sin on their hands. You know, so who are they to tell us? But um, yeah, I suppose it does demonstrate that... Um, motions from general synod can have a global impact and you know uh yeah people are speaking into yeah i mean i'm, I'm ready the way discussing in ways that maybe we never thought they would do yeah indeed yeah, yeah. um anyway moving on daniel we've also got this story about the smp haven't we um mm. so i mean again i'm not particularly like massively invested in this because i don't really care what happens to the smp but it's interesting that kate forbes who's actually a very she's actually a young woman isn't she she's 30 32 old. yeah 32 years yeah, old 32 oh. um so to be to be you know having this uh going on is extraordinary for her but essentially she was the front runner she was asked about her view on gay marriage and she said she mm. wouldn't have voted for it um what does she say? I think for me, Ang Angela Merkel is the example I would follow. I would have voted as a matter of conscience along the lines of mainstream teaching in most major religions that marriage is between a man and a woman. And she said this because she is she is a some kind of Christian, isn't she? I don't know. If she's in, she, she, she's a member of the Free Church of Scotland. For those who don't understand um, religion, um, but north of the border, um, the majority religion is Presbyterian for various historical accidents and reasons, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, that is, congregations without Episcopal oversight. Uh, and um, there's a very, very small Anglican setup called the Episcopal, Scottish Episcopal Church, uh, which I've worked in. And then there's a breakaway, there was a breakaway movement. I think it's about 1900, there was a schism of uh the, the conservative side or some of the conservative side of um 
the uh, Presbyterian Church, which became the We Freeze, right. and uh, you know, a famous for now. They're actually doing quite well because. Uh, and that's, uh, Daniel, just to be clear, that's uh, the Free Church of Scotland. That's the Free Church of Scotland, and yeah. you know, if you go up into the islands, you'll hear the Psalms chanted in Gaelic. If I got that right, not Gaelic, Gaelic. Um, and of course, you know, it's it's um, it's very it's a very moving experience. But you know, they're 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 strict Sabbatarians um they're they're culturally morally conservative uh and um they're not very big it's about ten thousand it's about ten thousand people and about 150 odd congregations um mostly on the extremities of uh of, of scotland um but um strangely and now you know uh, a bit like um the gospel choirs in it was the Harlem Gospel Choir in New York. You know, people go to sit to listen to to that. You know, they'll, they'll get a they'll get an hour long sermon on top of that as well. But the mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the the liturgy, the, the psalm liturgy, is, is 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 second to none. You know, so yeah, um, yeah. we we freeze have a have a reputation for being you know very very strict Calvinistic and so on. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, that that's what she's in it, and it, you know, it's in, interesting that yeah. She's got so high up in the SMP. Um, I, I don't. I can't quite understand how that's happened, considering the political landscape, which is, you know, very um, left of centre. Uh, oh yes, yeah, they're, they're completely woke, aren't they? Yeah, woke fascists, basically. Well, at least Nicholas. Sturgeon but but did, but did you notice in the the in the various interviews? I mean, it looks like her campaign's being derailed somewhat by by her her views on this but uh when it came when the bbc came to interview her it was all about um the sexual revolution stuff mm -hmm. yeah um but the other candidates didn't get asked that yeah so she one of them one of them is a practicing muslim didn't, yeah, get, so... up, didn't get asked that but yeah. you know so you can be a conservative muslim a conservative you know we've got a hindu prime minister um, but it seems to be, a, you know, a small o orthodox Christian is now a bar to public office in, in the eyes of the media. You know, well, that's where the spotlight is going to be on. Mm. Um, a bit like Tim Farron, you know. Yeah. So there's uh, Hamza Youssef you're talking about, who's a, apparently a devout Muslim, though. I don't I find it hard to understand how somebody could be a devout Muslim yet. Um, well, he approved he voted to approve the general principle of same sex marriage but it wasn't present for the final division that signed off the legislation. But he has said that he would not legislate on the basis of his faith if he became the SNP leader. But you're quite right, Daniel. It's 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 clearly anti-Christian discrimination, isn't it? She can't she can't be the leader, but a Muslim can, as though Muslims are sort of traditionally more progressive than Christians. You know, yeah. it's it's absurd. It's absolutely crazy. How do you actually how do you even I mean, how do you account for it? I mean, obviously, what I would say is that it's anti-Christian because the world is animated by a spirit which is against mm. Christ and is against the truth. And this is why Christians are, um, you know, not allowed to hold these offices in our country, because she would have a, a good influence uh, relative to the other people who are running for this role. But how could you actually, from a sort of rational, you know, leaving out, not that I'm saying that my view is irrational, but you know, from a sort of rational perspective, how do you actually make sense of that? What do you yeah. think? I mean, what do you think well, secular well, people think I, of this when they're looking at this and think, why is this Muslim allowed to become the leader, but she isn't? Would you not think it's to do? And here I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing. You know, the the conservative gay journalist Douglas Murray, yeah, who said that we have within the West a kind of sadomasochistic tendency that um, it is particularly post-war. So that you know, all our progressive politics is about naming and shaming anything to do with the past, mm. uh, and that means that we have to uh, it, attack those foundations. You know, so yeah, the, the idea sense. that that we are um, we should be ashamed of empire, colonization, um, you know. Christianity, patriarchy, and so on. It's all seen in the same package of stuff that is um now unfashionable and it's not it's not part of bourgeois sensibilities. Mm, so yeah. it, it's 
it, it's hacksawed away. Uh, but if you are, you know, if you are uh, culturally conservative, but from an ethnic minority, then you're um, you have kind of diversity points. Yeah. So so because... that leads to a, an absurd situation, doesn't it? Because you get any any group that has ostensibly been marginalised is therefore approved of. But then you have groups being approved of who, um, which would, you know, not really be congruous with each other. So feminists um, and, you know, the so-called LGBTQIA plus, et cetera, community, but then also Muslims. So it doesn't really make it doesn't you, when you got to that point, you think, well, you can't approve of all of these things all at the same time because Muslims don't approve of those other groups and what they stand for so it's kind of crazy isn't it hmm. and so who's postmodern now yeah exactly that's you way know. more postmodern than us uh yeah. way way so yeah um and, and you end up with these kind of ludicrous situations you know with sort of turf feminists where you've got feminists who are who are who have biological exact opinions about what is a woman and they're being attacked by the transsexual lobby you know yeah. uh by the trans lobby so um, the feminists the feminists go both ways don't they you've got to be careful what you say nowadays um they either approve of the trans thing or they don't approve and whether or not they approve that that um well that that sort of means that they're on one so the, so the feminists are kind of diametrically opposed on this aren't they i guess that's what i'm trying to say it's like there are two sort of uh, there are two sort of tribes within or armies really within the feminist mm. uh, some mm. of whom are, are, are approving of the transgender thing and some of whom think it's an absolute it's absolutely antithetical to feminism and so mm. feminism is is you know depending on which side you're on there you're you're you know there's a really different types of feminists i think mm. so you've got a wave of feminism now that is you know in a way having s s sympathetic conversations or, or with um you know culturally conservatives mm, yeah orthodox yeah. christians and, like, and like so on by, by irony you know yeah. i mean one of one of the, the, the things that that's often misunderstood as well in the culture for instance the whole windrush thing within the church of england i, I i'm convinced of this that when you know when the archbishop of canterbury says for instance you know the church of england is systematically racist and we've got to apologize for the way that we treated um those who came over from um, africa and the caribbean to join um our you know to join our communities and, and walk through our churches and they got a cold welcome well i think that there's a certain truth in that but you know what when you look at the nature of the the, the communities that were found that left the church you know that didn't that became Pentecostal or um, free, whatever kind of denominate, whatever sort of mm, uh, yeah, non-denominational yeah. setups they had, um, and have proven very successful. They rejected the Church of England because it was seen as wishy-washy, mm. because they couldn't connect with the the faith that they had been brought up to believe in, the versions of Anglicanism that they had in in these countries of origins didn't match what they found uh, in their new home. But we easily paint it as, oh, it was just simply racism. Well, actually, no, there was a theological divide. There was quite, I think, if I, you know, quite substantial. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hear the point you're making. How does that relate to what we were just talking to about I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the way that we look at issues like this, this whole postmodern idea that all truths are the same, right. we can look at something like what's happened in, in the church in terms of discrimination mm. and use exactly the same, you know, uh, bland theological lens of, oh, it's all discrimination. It was mm. all discrimination. You know, we don't want yeah, Kate no, Forbes. Mean, yeah. We don't want Kate Forbes to be the leader of the SMB, you know, because um, she'll just she'll just up the ante on discrimination. You know, she'll, mm. she'll take us backwards. And it's the same, same sort of um, narrative that's being used. 
Yeah, um, it, it's 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 a crazy situation, isn't it? When you think about it, how we could just go from Nicola Sturgeon to a concern that you know we've got this Orthodox Christian who'll be coming in and being a uh, being all uh, racist and whatever she's supposed to be. What is she supposed to be oh, against? Oh, yeah, homophobic and mm. you know. I mean, Sturgeon. Well, one of the things I actually heard Toby Young saying this, so credit to him for this observation. But because she was such a dictator, she obviously. Did she obviously wasn't raising up, you know, the next generation of leaders because she crushed opposition to her leadership as dictators tend to do. So there's a kind of power vacuum there, isn't there, where there's a sort of an opportunity now for a bit of difference. But honestly, Daniel, I mean, really, politically, I don't really care what happens. I'd prefer it if the SNP um, just became a complete irrelevance, to be honest. And so that's m- but I, I've got no skin in the game, really. I'm not Scottish mm-hmm. and I, I I don't live there. Uh, I feel sorry for Kate Forbes uh, if she if she get, you know, if she can't uh, run because of this. But she did the right thing, didn't she, by speaking plainly and and telling the truth and and maintaining her integrity, which is ultimately far more important than than a political career. So good for her. Mm. Yeah. We're going to move from the sublime to ridiculous now. Yeah, we? we are. We're going to talk about Roald Dahl, whose mm. books have been um, rewritten uh, based on um, sensitivity readings. Um, so got, I've got an article in The Guardian here, which I thought would be good to pull up something from The Guardian to see if there was any way they could try and justify this. Um, Augustus Gloop. Charlie's gluttonous antagonist in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which was originally published in 1964, is no longer enormously fat. Now he's just enormous. In the new edition of Witches, isn't it called The Witches? It's not just called Witches, is it? A supernatural the witches, female. Yeah, The Witches. A, a supernatural, maybe they've taken that away because it's kind of, um, mm. I don't know, heteronormative or something. A supernatural female posing as an extra an ordinary woman, maybe working as a top scientist or running a business instead of as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman. That was- Which is quite ridiculous, isn't it? Because you think the the whole point of that paragraph was to say that they they may be disguised as ordinary people. You know, they're they're, they're trying mm. to get a the witches were trying to get um, below the radar they didn't want to be noticed you're yeah. going to be a top science stem researcher you're going to be very noticeable yeah of the course. idea was that they were under the radar yeah you if you were running you know, if you were a top scientist you know you you'd be very conspicuous the word black was removed from the descri- description of the terrible tractors in the fabulous mr fox the machines are now simply murderous brutal looking monsters whereas before the word black was in there somewhere um i think those are all the examples we've got here i mean it is crazy isn't it um, uh, what white is taken out isn't white it? Is, yeah, so, white, so and so way white pale now. white it just just goes pale now yeah because it's just odd, the, just the it? very mention of whiteness might be might be so much um might bring about so much emotional trauma for people who have been victims of of white supremacy and racism um uh, we've got a quote here from the Roald Dahl Story Company. And uh, who who is actually saying this? I can't actually mind. Oh, yeah. So here we are. The language was reviewed in partnership with Inclusive Minds, a collective working to make a collective. Oh, a collective working. Sorry, I thought it was all sort of a noun together. A collective working to make children's literature more inclusive and accessible. Oh, well, yeah, they sound fun. Any changes were small and carefully considered. It said the analysis started in 2020 before Netflix bought the Dahl, Roald Dahl Story Company and embarked on plans to produce a new generation of films. Uh, this is the company. Who is this then? Is this is this Netflix or Inclusive Minds? It's not actually clear. I think it's Netflix that. own it, don't they? Or Puffin. I don't, know who said, I don't know who said this. Oh, yeah, maybe it will no. be. This may be Puffin, actually. Mm. Uh, when publishing new print runs of books written years ago, it's not unusual. You can't. You can't. You can't help but want to sing Tom Jones when you say those words. <laughs> it's not unusual. Oh, Delilah. No, God. Yeah, exactly. It's not unusual <laughs> to be loved at any time. No, it's not unusual to review the language used alongside updating other details, including a book's cover and page layout. Our guiding principle throughout has been to maintain the storylines, characters, and the irreverence and sharp edged spirit of the original text. It's slightly disingenuous, isn't it? Um, no. You know, making as making if. out that the language is as incidental a detail as the book's cover and page layout. And like our guiding principle throughout has been to maintain the look, if I look, 
if I was an author, and I am an author, by the way, because I've written I've written a book. But if I if I was an author and somebody and my publisher said to me, like, well, we've got these guiding principles where basically what we'll do is we'll we'll maintain, you know, broadly speaking, the storyline, the characters and and the spirit of the text. Um, and those will be our guidelines for how we treat your intellectual property. I'd say, well, I'm not publishing my books with you anymore because you're not allowed to do that to my books without my consent. So, yeah, you yeah. Know, get stuff it's, it's, it's yeah. outrageous isn't it i mean you know our guiding we've got a guiding principle here that when we have this you know intellectual you know and and it's not just intellectual property is it it's it's a it's a corpus of children's books which is has been loved by millions and millions of children for for decades and has you know formed a, a really important part of of lots of people's childhoods and uh, their family life you know reading books books to your kids i've read some roald dahl to my kids mm. and to say that like as a publishing company you've got the right to sort of come in and 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 edit it according to your ideological um uh, your ideological um I'm trying to think of the right word, but things that you would prefer ideologically, your pref- I don't know if preferments is the right word, but things mm. that you prefer ideologically is outrageous. You know, you this is not the way that literature works. Thank you very much. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, yeah. that, that now we've got this situation where the, uh, uh, the copies that we've all got become sort of contraband. You know? And I think, I think that any child, it, given two copies of the same book, you know, Charlie and the Vegan Factory, whatever it is now, <laughs> and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, and and told that one's been edited in this way and the other hasn't, uh, and um, given no supervision by an adult is going to be looking yeah. at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and giving yeah. the vegan the heave-ho. I'm exactly. sorry. Of course, um, yeah, because because <laughs> the irreverence and sharp edged spirit of the original text is not compatible with um, making children's literature more inclusive and accessible. I'm sorry, but those things are those contradict. You know, censorship is con. It, you know, if your censors do not lead, censorship does not lead towards making things more irreverent and sharp edged. Let's say no. it that way. It moves in no. completely the other direction direction. It makes it conformist, it makes it bland, it makes it anodyne, and it takes away the originality. That's that's what's so bad about censorship. Is it yeah, particularly rolled out everything. That was his yeah. USP. Yeah. That it's a that's little bit dodgy. Was... You know, it's a little <laughs> bit like, oh, I can't believe you just said that. Uh, you're just taking the dodge out of my Roald Dahl. I, I asked um Chat GBT to oh, rewrite yeah. them in the spirit of the puffin re-edit. Now is this, and, is this and, did and, you and, actually do this? Yeah, and it, it actually initially it gave a disclaimer saying, Oh, you know, I shouldn't really do this. It's choking, really. And then it did it. <laughs> anyway, and then I'll go on, do it. And then it oh, did let's, it. Let's, so let's have it a, had let's Charlie and the non-gender specific, abled, neurodivergent, differently aged chocolate factory. Abled bodies. Abled yeah. body. It's a, it says abled body. Is that I not heard that? Yeah. James and the really giant good. vegetable that wasn't judged on its appearance. Yeah, very good. Uh, the fantastic disabled creatures and where to find them. Now, hang on a second here. I didn't think you were allowed to use this word disabled anymore. I, I thought it was so differently Dif- abled. Differently yeah. abled, yeah. I think disabled is a kind uh, of, is a slightly archaic, yeah, archaic it could trigger, term. couldn't it? it could the witches, a respectful exploration of women's unique traits and talents. Mm, which if you look at the current book selections that, uh, that front most W.H. Smith, it's all mm. on Wicca and witchcraft. So, um, you know, they've been much misunderstood, clearly. Yeah. Matilda, yeah. a child prodigy struggle against adultism and ageism. <laughs> the BFG, a size acceptance story. <laughs> the Twits, a thought provoking examination of negative stereotypes and their impact. <laughs> the Twits, honestly. Coming to a library near you, kids. Can't wait. Lap it up. I can't wait. Well, I will never, ever, ever, I will never, ever, ever, ever buy one of those books. And I'll never read one of those to my children either. And I'm sure many, many people would be thinking exactly the same thing, that they've got no interest in these yeah. uh, a san- a sanitized version of. E- even the prime Morgan. minister is upset. Even the prime minister. Even the e- even nice Rishi. It must, be, it must be bad. Do you know what he's actually said? I'd heard he'd said something, but I don't know. What did yeah. he say about it? 
I'll look it up. They disagreed with it. But... Yeah. The word I was trying to look for earlier was preference, ideological preference. That's what that's what I should have said. If I'd been more articulate, I would have said that. The fact that they want to edit edit these books based on their ideological preferences is outrageous. And um, how do you spell rolled? I can't even. Yeah, it's like that, isn't it? Uh, rolled dal. What what happens when I type in Rishi Sunak is it comes up immediately that he's five foot seven, which um, you know is 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 on the short side, let's say. But yeah, it's not it's not disastrously short, mm-hmm. and um, it's the same height as Tom Cruise. Mm. Uh, and i and 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 for a second week in a row and napoleon and napoleon and look look at all of his achievements I mean, no. he was this, he was a psychopath and he was you know he was responsible for the deaths of millions of people and he was a really bad man just to be clear um mis- i thought you'd been misunderstood <laughs> yeah by by ablists mm. by by uh those who would challenge the the vertically those who would oppress the vertically challenged let's say mm. um oh look it's only a spokesman mr sunak spokesman said works of fiction should be prever- preserved and not airbrushed uh, borrowing a word Dahl invented for playing with language, the PM spokesman said, when it comes to our rich and varied literary heritage, the Prime Minister agrees with the BFG that we shouldn't gobble funk around with words. Um, so, And also Salman Rushdie has condemned it as well and said mm. he was no angel, but this is absurd censorship. He's quite right about that. So anyway, Daniel, I think we should move on because time is moving mm, on. Yeah, I, do, we, I, I really, yeah. really want to... Discuss. So, some people have asked about this Asbury revival thing, and I should we should give some context here because for many people this would be a completely sort of alien thing, and they won't they won't get it at all. Mm-hmm. So, basically, in Asbury, which is in Kentucky, in the US, there is a or at least there there was. I'm not sure if it's still going on. There is a there is some kind of campus revival going on in a Christian college, mm-hmm. and as I understand it, basically what's happened is that. Um, they the the students of this college which is the equivalent of a university um in america so the the students gather every day for for prayer and and worship but it only lasts you know 10 minutes or something like that um but at the end of one of these sessions there was a sort of palpable sense of the presence of god and what happened was the students didn't want to leave and so they sort of carried on praying and worshipping and then other people came along and then this sort of grew and it got more intense and they just kept this thing going and then eventually people from other universities were coming in and from other towns and then and then eventually it ended up with just thousands of people flocking to this place for prayer and worship it's still going on it's going it's it's going on now so so there are thousands and thousands of people going to this thing and apparently it's characterized by sort of um sort of deep feelings of um the sense of the presence of god of repentance of contrition of people responding to the uh, altar calls um and and so on and so forth and these kind of revivals have precedent in history um in in the modern age and and historically as well i mean there's the great awakening in in jonathan edwards america um mm. there's a there was a, a wesleyan revival in this country there was a revival a charismatic revival in in wales in azusa street in the early 20th century and there have been other things, you know, perhaps less significant things um, than those, you know, uh, happening reasonably frequently. And those bigger ones, I think it's fair to say, have been characterized by not only the actual sort of meetings themselves, but that the the, the fact that so many people have converted to Christianity in this kind of, um, well, I don't really know how to call it, but this sort of thoroughgoing way has had an effect on the social infrastructure, the, the societies. Uh, 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 that, that that these revivals have happened in so you know you've you've ended up with christian institutions you know christian schools or cri- more more christian governance or whatever it might be um so it's been a kind of you know it's a revival not just of individuals but of of society as well where that's happened um and i think jonathan edwards and um uh, the revival associated with him the great awakening is is a really good example of that now just to share a bit I mean, I'm really interested to hear your view, Daniel, because you've obviously got a completely different background to me. But I spent many years in um, charismatic evangelical churches where the, the talk was always about revival, you know, like revival is coming, revival is just around the corner. And when they were talking about revival, they were talking about this kind of thing. And um, I when I, I sort of heard a little bit about Asprey, but I haven't really taken very much interest in it because and, and I 
having been asked about it, it's made me think, well, why wasn't I very interested in it? And I think it's because having been in those kind of churches, I do have a sort of slight inbuilt scepticism about this kind of thing. A scepticism which I'm I'm very I'm very happy to have critiqued and I'm very happy to be to be open minded about my own sort of biases. Um there is a very good article that sort of someone shared on our telegram actually that sort of sums up a, a lot of a lot of what I think about this. Um and it 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 basically makes well it makes a couple of, of points. The first thing it says, which which might be, sort of sound slightly patronizing, is it makes a comparison with um the beginning of Netflix's new film version of All Quiet on the Western Front, where you've got these young lads who are sort of hopeful and zealous and they're going off to war and they're all very they're all very excited about it. And basically this this author who I think is a woman, no, it's a man actually. Um, he 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 says, you know, that the Christian life and the, the the battle we're engaged in is is not like that. War is actually hell, and what we're going, what we're what we're actually um, experiencing in culture at the moment is a, is a is is a is a is a gritty and brutal battle between the forces of of darkness and light, and that um, what is going to change our culture is not this sort of you know esoteric emotional uh, experience that these kind of people are, are having it's actually going to be about um witnessing for christ um regardless of the personal cost being faithful day to day with the things that god has called us to do as um as uh, you know in whatever context we are whether we're priests whether we're uh, family people uh, whether we're single in our work etc cetera, etc cetera. you know the kind of thing that we talk about a lot on this podcast and and this is a as I say, this is kind of day to day struggle between the forces of darkness and light, and um, and that that's that's the real reality we should be focusing on. So this article isn't completely dismissive of the revival. I think it'd be good to talk about some of the positive things. Um, he writes here in desperation for any semblance of hope for our culture. Some Christians have abandoned all discernment. They're eager to idolize anything or any revival that professes Christ. But our hope isn't a change in culture. But our hope isn't a change in our culture. Our hope isn't in a revival. Our hope isn't in a Christian culture. All of these are good. Uh, we should pray earnestly that God would change our culture. But our hope isn't in the return of a Christian culture. Our one hope is in the return of Christ. Um, now, I think that uh, that's probably taking it slightly too far, if I'm honest with you. I think we should hope for a revival of, of Christianity in our, our culture and that we should pray for it and we should we should desire it. I guess my sort of question is whether what the connection is between these sorts of revivals are and the kind of transformation that we'd like to see in in culture, um, because obviously I'd like to see a transformation of the culture into a more Christian culture. And clearly that can only really happen if millions and millions and millions of people start becoming really sincere Christians. Um, but I, sometimes I struggle a little bit to see the the relationship of these kind of revivals with with that change in culture mm -hmm. just one more thought daniel sorry i know i'm talking quite a lot here but i'm sort of processing this as i'm going my experience of being involved in those kind of churches now i don't want to project everything about it but a lot of the time i did feel like i'm not really sure that this is uh, well let's put it this way there can be a lot of hype and um again you know i think I was much younger. I was in my early twenties, really, when I was in this kind of environment. But I always had this like slightly uneasy feeling that I'm not really sure that I'm not really sure what a connection this has to an authentic um, and genuine Christian life. And even though I'm, it's crazy because even though I'm in this kind of this church, which is you know so questionable on so many levels, like we talked about, you know, with the Church of England, I still feel like now I have I'm more in touch with what an authentic and genuine Christian life is. And I'm much, I'm far less connected with any of that kind of charismatic or, charismatic or, or, um, or, you know, or experiential stuff, let's say. Uh, there's still an experiential aspect to my spirituality, but it's far, there's far less of an emphasis now. And I feel, I feel much more, I feel much more like I have a, I have an understanding of what I should be doing as a, as a, as a follower of Christ. Um, so it doesn't bother me that I'm not, I'm not really particularly interested in this kind of stuff. So as I say, I'm I'm willing to be open 
um, Rod Dreher wrote a really good blog where he expressed a real openness and he said, you know, it's not my tradition, but I'm really open to this and, and God can do whatever he wants, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, have a, I have a similar outlook. I think we do need to have faith. We do need to be open to what God is doing. We do need to be resistant to cynicism and the um, the sort of reflex reaction of just writing things off because we want to appear like we you know, can debunk them, which can actually be a real expression of unbelief, actually. Like we just don't believe in the Holy Spirit. So we don't believe that he really works in the world. So I think we have to resist all of those things. But nevertheless, I do have those kind of reservations. So anyway, I said a lot there, Daniel. So what's your take on that? I think it takes time to discern on all mm. these things. And time will tell uh, where the hand of God has been in, in this. And um, I, I suppose... I'm sceptical of a revival of the culture, but I'm not sceptical of a revival of a church or a denomination. Yeah. You know, because I think that's on a smaller scale. Um, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be adverse to saying, oh, this church is having a revival. Um, but I don't actually really believe that because I think that, that can be potentially true. You know, that can happen. But uh as for that turning the whole Titanic secular culture around, I think we've I'm much more in the Benedict option camp yeah. there that we yeah. have a we have a long exile ahead of us. Would revival help us in that task? You know, would it create the kind of spiritual muscle memory that says, you know, uh, my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord? And that is going to, you know, enable me and empower me to go deeper in my faith and to accept uh, the loss and suffering and the marginalization and the intolerance. Um, maybe. Yeah. Um, I, the, da- the danger is, as we said before, is a is having a psycho- psychological prosperity gospel where it's all about, you know, experiential feelings and nice feelings and transcendent feelings only. Um, and has no connection to say, you know, your how you live your life Monday to to Saturday. Um, you know how how fair you treat your employers if you're if you run a company. Um, how generous and charitable you are to others. How you stand and witness up to Christian truths um, when you know that's going to be costly, and so on and so on. You know, um, mm. so. Um, yeah. How, uh, I think, also, I, think I, think, only, I, I don't really know this tradition. I don't know yeah. where, where these people are coming from. Um, I, I, I probably know, you know, my, my, my nearest equivalence, I, I would say to anything like this is, uh, has been through, you know, uh, majority of my family is Roman Catholic. So it, it's sort of Catholic revivals, Marian shrines and things, mm. which are not dissimilar in some ways. Um mm yeah yeah well i mean i think also daniel another thing there you know when you say you're 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 you know really really i really agree with you when you say this thing about you know how does it connect with your your everyday life because i think that's absolutely correct i think also with that it's it's also um relevant to ask what relationship this kind of thing has to the way we would deal with suffering as well and if we see suffering and sacrifice as central to the christian life um mm. you know no, I'm not. I don't. I, I'm not saying there's some kind of contradiction here or something like that. I'm just saying that there's a sort of there's a sort of vibe which I, I understand is a I understand is a vague word, but it's it's a sort of vibe. It's like a kind of triumphalism. And if you watch, I've watched some of the videos, and it does remind me quite a lot of certain things I you know attended when I was when I was younger. And it is this kind of thing of you know this sort of well we're we're all together and we're sort of shouting and we're really happy and this is revival etc cetera, etc cetera, and we're desperate for for the presence of God and and so on and so forth. And yeah, I mean mm. that's great. But what do we mean when we talk about the presence of God? I mean, it's great if the presence of God comes to our, comes upon us in worship and we have these wonderful feelings. But also the presence of God is manifested through suffering and sacrifice. And that's a central part of the Christian life as we suffer. And, and the we, absence of God, you know, which, which yeah. you know, when the, the problem can be that some, some of these non-denominational traditions uh, are not connected to the great tradition the memory of the church you know if you look at the works of like 
trees of Avila, you clearly see a sense that that the the experience of spiritual aridity can be where God can be doing His greatest. You know, and yeah. for goodness' sake, we we read the scriptures um, written by a desert people. You know, and they, they understand that forty years in the wilderness, going round and round and round and round, and and um, uh, <laughs> and needing that time. And I think that the 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 danger is to be disconnected from the from those truths um what what struck this is, me this is uh just just can i just come in here daniel just because yeah, it's on. so it's so relevant to what you're saying um what i was um reading recently uh when i reread uh the screw tape letters by c.s lewis he makes a really similar point you know by implication in that book about the way that god is actually training our wills through those barren periods when we don't have the feelings then that's the time when we're actually training our wills to 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 love god and to desire god and to to pray is when we don't feel like doing these things so i think that that that's a i think as spiritually speaking that's a really similar point to the point mm. i don't i'm less familiar with well, um i i know that for some churches the lectionary last sunday was the transfiguration when we had yeah. that at our church you know and uh, if you look at that at face value in terms of the life of the those apostles that went up the hill with christ and had this magnificent overwhelming experience you know of, of both the terror and the joy uh you know of of the voice of god of christ illuminated um moses and elijah at his side you know if that was given to them to prep them for calvary the other hill mm. well really it only worked really on on john yeah if we take him to be the yeah, beloved disciple next to christ at the cross yeah, because yeah. Peter chickened and James has no mention. Um, you know, everybody scarpered. Yeah. And those two had had that illuminating experience mm. to prep them up, I, I would say, for what was going to come, the road to Jerusalem. Yeah. 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 No, so it's no guarantee having this experience that you're potentially going to, you know, do the whole go, go the whole way in terms of um suffering for your faith mm -hmm. yep yep but it can help you know let, let's say this was this helped john yeah this yeah. helped him put into perspective you know that he yeah. was going to have a very tough life yeah and, and like i say daniel you know i i really want to resist this desire to be dismissive because i think you know having a kind of attitude of faith and of of being willing to accept that god could do things that you don't understand or that you even don't really like very much that don't really appeal to your sensibilities i think that's an important thing but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to accept and and celebrate everything um at, at, at face value and I, I you know this for me like one of the things i feel nervous about is this thing about crowds you know i've just read um uh, Mat matthias desmet's book um the psychology of totalitarianism and that book has a very sophisticated reading of the corona virus situation and and many other situations like it when large groups of people large crowds if you like underwent a sort of mass formation hypnosis really or mass formation psychosis um and and human beings in crowds when they're sort of overtaken by a sort of in uh, uh, a, an enthusiasm within the context of a crowd they ge it's generally not a great thing you know mm -hmm. because because the individual um sort of sacrifices himself to this sort of slightly crazy collectivity and often you know the sort of um normal uh, ethical um and often political boundaries are transgressed in in not in, in not very good ways, to put it mildly. Now, well, I'm, I'm you see that throughout the scripture, don't you? That actually the Bible is actually quite realistic about that. And picks up what just exactly what you're saying. You know, if you think yeah. of um, the arriving yeah. at the other side, the Red Sea. Yeah. You know, everybody's terribly excited and has this amazing experience, and then very soon after, they're building a golden calf. Yeah, yeah, and you've got you've got those stuff, those things in the Book of Acts where you have these riots described in quite re quite yeah. um, realistic terms, actually. And and sometimes it's interesting in the Book of Acts. It'd be interesting to do a comparison between that and what Desmond says because there's uh, there's at least one time where the crowd actually doesn't know what it's rioting about, <laughs> and it's been overtaken with this kind of collective spirit. And everyone's confused. There's there's um, 
there's lots of examples of that happening, isn't it? That 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 can that can easily be triggered. Uh, you know, I was thinking of John six, where they are after the miracle mm -hmm. of those and the fishes. Clearly, the people are uh, are, are just you know have that that sort of group sense we must make him king yeah. and and he slips away from them which yeah. again you know shows the biblical perspective on crowds is very cautionary mm. and likewise at the you know palm sunday mm. they you know hosanna to the king of david a few days later crucify crucify yeah yeah that's got to be the main example that 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 the, the scriptures, yes, celebrate this, these corporate experiences that can be spiritual and serendipitous. They're also very cautionary. Yeah, yeah, because there's a there's a um, there's a sort of there's a power that a crowd has when an idea takes root within it, and it's it's very. This is actually really interesting to me because of because i think back to my experience in the charismatic churches and and as i was becoming less comfortable with it and to be honest i'm not really massively comfortable in those kind of settings nowadays um <coughs> now i watched um, a video that was on rodre's blog of this young man at the asbury revival um and he was giving a testimony and he was talking about all the stuff that was going on and as he was talking the pitch of his voice was rising and you could hear more and more people kind of cheering and clapping until it until it reached a kind of crescendo and mm -hmm. there was this sort of climax where the whole crowd kind of broke out and everyone was cheering and you know this is revival etc cetera, etc cetera. now i don't again i don't want to dismiss it or anything like that but i know what it feels like to be in a room full of people who are doing that kind of thing and when I don't really want to join in and it's an extremely uncomfortable, it's extremely uncomfortable because you feel this, do you feel this huge amount of pressure mm -hmm. upon you? This it is, it's a kind of intangible. You can't even say why you feel it. Is it because you're worried that people will be looking at you and you're not doing it? Or you're not doing it like them. Is it because people will think you're not a proper Christian? Is it just the force of being in a crowd of people who are doing, you know, doing something in particular, which is a sort of collective activity and you don't want to join in. It's, it's, it's incredibly kind of powerful. And you can imagine how that sort of power within a crowd sort of takes hold of people more generally and sort of animates the crowd such that the crowd almost becomes an entity in itself, you know? And, I, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of debunk what's going on or anything like that, but I just think there has to be a sort of element of that to to what's going on, and maybe God can use that, and maybe that's not entirely bad. But I don't know. That sort of seems to me to be a, um, you know, it seems to me to be a a, a, a common feature of what it what it's like to be in a crowd. Mm. So I don't know. I, oh, I, we have to say when when the uh, ir irreverent. <laughs> crowd gather it's it's incredibly genteel and um yeah but i mean uh, you know just but uh, it's to say as well it's a great thing sometimes isn't it when you have a crowd together and everyone's having a great time like when you're you know i love going to watch football matches i mean well i've been to one for many years but you know i used to love going to watch spurs and and you know a live events another good example it can be a great thing to be in a crowd can't it and the the, the energy can be entirely positive and it can be a tight you know something you totally think is a great thing and you know, you're all having a brilliant time and you feel buoyed up by it. And mm. so I'm not necessarily saying it's a it's a negative thing. All I'm saying is that a crowd can have a kind of animation. Yeah. And, and there's a sense in which a lot of what we've been writing into and speaking about um, is about building up a resilience not to go with the crowd. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that the, the, the sort of spiritual practices and the the thoughtfulness and the, the reading of scripture and the, you know, all those things um, which help you so that when the when the time comes, you're not just swept away with it, but you're you're holding back um, mm -hmm. in the in the right way, you know, so yeah, maybe we're both talking from that angle as well mindful of the last three years yeah absolutely yeah that's true that's a good point that's a good point daniel should move on i think this is really interesting conversation but there are a couple of other really big mm. things to talk about so just in in uh we should have a kind of name for this where at the end of the podcast we sort of update people about the um disastrous consequences of 
um, the bishops and the general synod voting for same sex uh, blessing of same sex couples in our churches. Um, uh, so, I mean, well, the first thing to say as well is that um, there was an interesting story uh, about how there are all these rumours that the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, is going to um, retire or resign. I don't know. I, I assume it's retire. Mm. Um, and t- the Tory, the Tories are apparently drawing up a list of less woke candidates to replace him uh, because they don't like the fact that he criticised them for their Rwanda plan and for various other things he said. Um, archbishops are normally chosen from the 42 Darson bishop, although Darson bishops, although one sort said it would want to widen the gene pool. Some of the 73 suffragan bishops would be considered for elevation. So uh, if anyone's got any um, suggestions, they could send them into their Tory MP if they've got one, I suppose. You've put a picture of Jordan Peterson ho- holding a, an orb and (laughs) i don't yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure he's going to get the job yeah nice nice he's looking well you know i just struggle with this hierarchy thing you know (laughs) yeah it's very good um so yeah so i don't know have you got any have you any comments on that don't know anyone you'd like to see apart from peterson next archbishop um yeah um no no not not off the top of my head we should Head. probably we should probably um, um have a kind of have a have a meeting before we endorse a candidate, shouldn't we? I suppose yeah. as, as official official irreverent endorsee. Yeah, in no way did they get any merch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? But how this has come in, in, in this particular junction, there is this sense uh, within government or Tory ranks that. They want someone uh, with, with a completely different kind of register, um, and and you know I suppose what what might be I suppose Justin Welby came as an unknown, didn't he, ten years ago? Because he'd only been the Bishop of Durham for nine months, uh, and you know you you could say I had lots of Tory credentials. You know, sort of mm. went to public went to private school at Eton. Um, seems to have sort of conservative, small c conservative sensibilities. You know, appeared on paper to be kind of largely um, sort of social conservative in in some ways. Uh, you know, and um, uh, associated with the the big HTB churches and so on. Um, and um, and now I think for them to be looking. Uh, at, at a different style of episcopate. I mean, I, I've, I've always said I think someone who, you know, I, I now harp on about Jordan Peterson, but someone who could connect, I think, with the the general public beyond all the bureaucracies and desk jobbing that's going that seems to suffocate the C of E. I in a, in a really sort of soulful, um, spiritual way, um, I, I think could have enormous impact. You know, but they'd have to suspend that. At, at the moment, the narrative in, in the C of E seems to be largely about saving the planet rather than saving souls. Yeah. And I think the actually going back to the saving souls stuff, I I think would would gain great traction. You know, um, yeah. And, and maybe that's a bit of an over a caricature, an oversimplification. But um, I, don't I don't think it is at all. Uh, I think you're exactly right. Um, it's also um, the other thing is that the, the Archbishop of Canterbury has come to be seen as a or to be thought of as somebody who's trying to hold the different parts of the communion together, uh, the communion and the Church of England, the Anglican communion worldwide and the Church of England in England. Uh, and that that needs to change as well, because if you think about yourself purely in that way, then I don't really think that that is that is what a, a ruler in the church should be doing. I think it's about providing vision. It's about so it's about um it's about guarding the deposit of faith, proclaiming the gospel and so on and so forth. So it's, I think it's got to be about I mean we're gonna go on to it in a minute about the reaction from yeah. um, other parts of the, the the Anglican communion to what's what's happened. But I think I, I believe that um just Justin Welby, I mean maybe this is, you know, he's um moving before being pushed in this role that is is, is beginning to acknowledge that there is a uh 
you know, colonial overtones in Canterbury being the president of the communion uh, and the instruments of communion, as they call them, being all centred around England. And I think rightly so, you know, uh, that if this is an international fellowship of Christians, it, it ironically sounds very colonial if everything is centred around Canterbury, um, yeah. where actually there's, you know, spiritually in this country, there, there isn't a tenth of the energy that is happening in other parts of the world. Yeah, you know, we need, Dan, Dan need a leader who's actually, you yeah. know, experienced and smelt success in a way that um, uh, can be very helpful to us, rather than. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree with that. Let's just let's just move on to that and and clarify what you've just said there about the context. So, uh, I think the latest stuff, um, the latest really that's happened is that some leaders from it's from the global south, isn't it, Daniel? Who uh, who are basically Orthodox Anglican bishops from largely from africa the global south fellowship of anglican churches have essentially said that they're very sad about what the church of england is doing in terms of same-sex blessing and um, that the church of england has now disqualified herself from leading the communion as the historic mother church and the church of england has broken communion with those promises provinces who remain faithful to the historic biblical faith expressed in the anglican formularies the global um the Global South Fellowship of Anglican Churches is no longer able to recognise the present Archbishop of Canterbury, the Right Honourable Most Reverend Justin Welby, is the first among equals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, basically, this is—I mean, so this is evidence, obviously, of the fact that the decisions that were made in General Synod—they've got implications for our relationship with. Um, other Christian churches globally who are not Anglicans, like the Eastern Orthodox Church, like the Roman Church, like free churches who are Orthodox on this matter. But what this is about is the fact that other Anglican churches who are, as Daniel was saying, has, have lots of energy um, and lots of people going there, you know, real um, vibrant, vibrant churches in, in Africa and, and elsewhere um, are breaking fellowship with the Church of England because mm -hmm. I think it works out in terms of percentage wise. If there's about, I think there are about 15 primates out of 40, but they represent 75% yeah. of the communion, which is about 18 million in total. So, um, and, and actually, Britain is, or England is rather um, strangely put down as having, you know, sort of 25 million members. Well, in fact, if you, the other communions, the other parts of the communion, the, those figures are actually practicing Anglicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not so, just people who write them on their census. Oh, C of E, tick the C of E box. You know, this is a very, very so. So we're kind of skewed in the data on this. And uh, so Daniel, can I sorry? Can I just finish the point? Just yeah, so make because I think it's really important um, because it relates to something you just said. Now, Justin Welby has been in recent weeks around the same time that this has been happening making noises about how you know it's not really right that we should have a um a global communion that's just arbitrarily centered in canterbury for historical reasons and indeed there's a very good article which I, again I'll, I'll put up which is is by Andrew Atherston, who's an academic at Wycliffe Hall, which is an Anglican training college in Oxford. It's on Ian Paul's blog where he makes the same point a great a great length that this is actually completely arbitrary, and he 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 frames it within the context of the thing about um, same sex blessings that you know it's it's it just it highlights the ridiculousness of this situation where you've got really a um, statistically um, marginal church. Uh, in England being the sort of focal point in Canterbury, you know, tiny mm. city, which we both lived in at different times in our lives, a tiny city in the southeast coast of England, kind of being the the the, the global mm. focus for this for this um, you know, 80, millions, 80 million Anglicans. Um, and he's saying it's, it's time to change. The only thing I just add to that, Daniel, so I, I, I guess, and that change would look like, you know, moving that focus for unity elsewhere to Africa and moving it around and so on. The only thing I would say to that is, uh, just to add, is that it's it's awfully convenient, isn't it, for Justin Welby to be saying things like that now when he is participating in something that will 
that is damaging the fa- fabric of the global Anglican Communion by um, by leading this process of of facilitating the blessing of same sex cu- same sex couples. So what I mean is that as he's doing that. As General Synod is doing that, we've got, you know, the videos, I was watching some of the videos of people standing up and applauding when this was announced at General Synod. As this is happening, provinces around the world are looking at this and and saying that the Church of England is departing from the historic Christian faith and that we're a schismatic church, that we're no longer orthodox, that they do not recognise us as, as part of the same church anymore, and they cannot recognise Justin Welby's authority over them. And that means that the the fabric of the Anglican communion is being irreparably, probably damaged by what's going on. At the same time, Justin Welby is saying, well, it's probably it's probably right that I wasn't the first among equals and I wasn't the focus for unity anyway. And maybe it should be somewhere else. But that but, I mean, it's it's kind of well, you're not anyway now because of what you're doing. You know, you've taken you've taken this step to alienate the orthodox provinces globally by pushing ahead with this agenda and and now we're a, now as far as these these significant provinces and primates are concerned we're a schismatic church so to, mm. so i just feel like saying well don't you know pretend that now you're sort of interested in this sort of um you know relinquishing your power because you know in some kind of you know progressive statement on colonialism because it's it's nothing to do with that as far as i'm concerned it's and it's everything to do with pushing forward this progressive agenda in the church of england i don't know what you think about that daniel but that's that's the way it feels to me yeah and um you know d- does this mean we're going to have a global north <laughs> yeah <laughs> of, of um of dying of, anglican churches <laughs> of increasingly marginalized uh, yeah i mean how to that church. yeah that, that, that's been one of the joys of being part of the Church of England is that we're part of this global fellowship. Yeah, and yeah. and why didn't Justin that, do this year, years ago either? You know, like why didn't he do it five years ago? Or he's been there for over ten years now, hasn't he? What what if he if he cared so much about you know having a having a more sort of diverse representation in the leadership of the global communion? Why didn't he do it ages ago? I, an interesting thing to add to to this because I I think there's been some disingenuous comments from. Uh, the church authorities on this saying, oh, well, you know, um, no province can tell another province what to do. And, you know, that we're, we're just a sort of a loose association. We'll try telling that to the ACNA, who Canterbury still do not admit. This is the Anglican Church of North America, the breakaway, very fast growing church mm. in America, you know, which has over like, a, I think, a thousand congregations and is um is is really seeing boom time in in terms of its planting whereas the the uh the, the episcopal church the american original setup is 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 dying on its feet you know mm-hmm. um and you know you've got the you've got archbishop foley beach going to the primates meeting three four years ago uh, as as a um a visitor as an observer um, when really all the other primates want to admit him into and his province into communion, but you know, so so for Canterbury to say, "Oh, we've got no power anyway," mm. it's genuine. Yes, you do have power. You have enormous power, um, and and it's not right. It's now time to move on and to share that pre- that presidency should be you know should be elsewhere. It should move around the communion as the primates see fit. But um, a Canterbury-centric primacy has enormous power to shut out mm. um, other yep. expression, you know, valid expressions of Anglicanism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. I think it's a really good point, Daniel. Really good yeah, point. There's, there's actually the irony, the possibility that if the primacy went up for vote, that, that the ACNA could get it. <laughs> huh, huh, huh. Because, you know, there, there were, I think he's, he's presiding over GAFCON, um, which is a similar group to the Global South, you know. Um, so, you know, let, let's not forget the irony of what's happening here. Yeah. And it just, you know, Daniel, it just comes over and over again. I mean, you read, uh, I, I find this particularly striking when I read the prophetic literature in the Old Testament over and over and over and over and over again. 
the same message. You know, the prophetic literature takes up a huge chunk of the entire Bible, doesn't it? But it's basically the same message. It's it's blessings for faithfulness and not blessings, or you might say curses, to use that slightly more Old Testament language, for disobedience and idolatry and faithlessness. And, and schism. schism yeah. comes with yeah, exactly. And that's the same thing in the church today. You just you could just you don't even have to believe in Christianity. You just look at the demographics, churches which hold to the historic Orthodox Christian faith, they teach it, they proclaim it, they live it. These churches on the whole are growing. And the ones which are not doing that, which are embracing the progressive agenda, are dying. And that is what is going to happen to the Church of England if it carries on in in this way um, and those churches are youthful yeah yeah they're, yeah and they're that, that's youthful. ironic isn't it because yeah. that's that's what the church of england bishops desperately want they desperately want young people in their churches they want these young trendy uh, cool young people in their churches so what they do is they try and appeal to them by using the language of progressivism but that will not reach them it will not reach them it never will. And and you, the only thing that will reach our culture, the only thing that will mean anything to our culture is something distinct and distinctively Christian. And this is what we're saying over and over and over and over again on this podcast. Yeah, um, we, we, you know, we, I, I feel like we're banging our head against the wall, yeah. really, on, on this. You know, that we personally, you know, it's not that we are seeing an irreverent revival, but we are certainly seeing a mass of interest. If if we, as three vicars, are seeing, uh, you know, our window must be minute to what's happening in the UK. And, and, and if we are being brought to the attention of thousands of people coming to Christ in the last couple of years, migrating from new atheism to, to you know, to a classic, informed, intelligent Christianity, but are struggling to find church because they're put off by what they're seeing in terms of the church's corporate presentation or vicars who roll their eyes at the idea of, you know, having uh, or new Orthodox people come into their congregations. Mm. And what, what can we say? You know, God is providing the cavalry over the hill uh, and we're just sort of saying, oh, well, we don't really want you. Yeah. Go away. Yep, yep. I think that's what we've been saying for for two years consistently, and you know, we, we keep what. Yep. Our, well, Archbishop, come on the podcast and have it out with us. Tell us where. Tell us where wrong. Well, I mean, all all I want tell to do. Tell us wrong. Yeah. All, all I want to do is just to encourage people that you know this is this is the way to go. You know, it's it's and it's, we're not saying anything revolutionary. We're just saying you know faithfulness to what it means to be in our context, uh, an Anglican Christian in the Church of England, an Orthodox Anglican Christian, uh, but more more generally to being to being faithful, to faithful to Christ and to, and to the word of God. Uh, that's that's what you need to do. And you need to do it confidently and with with faith. That's what we're called to. It's not it's not complicated. Uh, anyway, Daniel, we need to finish soon. So it's time for this. Let's do it. There's always a slight delay while my eye music loads up. But now it's time for this. Daniel, it's time for another version, episode, I don't know, installment of Question the Rev. Um, Jamie, you've frozen on the, on the YouTube. Have I? On, um, oh, on this, the happened, this happened the other day as well. Don't worry. Uh, it won't matter. We're, we've almost finished now, anyway. Um, question the Rev. I don't know why that's happened. That's annoying. Zoom is just rubbish. I know it's not actually. I take it back. Zoom is really good. Um, oh, my hang on a second. Another thing started playing. It was my son makes these little audio stories sometimes. Um, okay. So, Daniel, um, hi, Jamie, Daniel, and Tom. First, thank you for your podcast. I am trying my best to become a Christian, but the main thing that puts me off, unfortunately, is the other Christians I meet. So it's good to be reminded weekly that there are some thoughtful, like-minded ones out there. I understand that. Christians can sometimes be quite annoying, but um, most of the ones I, I know I like a lot. Anyway, I have a question around immigration. I believe that the only way out of the mess we're in in generally is to fully recover the traditions and beliefs as a country and culture that brought us to our peak and these were written 15 years ago question mark mm. uh, i'm not sure 
not sure what he means by that, uh, which to me basically means a proper, assertive, confident Christianity. However, I struggle to find a Christian argument against mass immigration. How do we follow the direction to be the Good Samaritan without allowing this to justify the destruction of our nation? Should I speak I, into this? So, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Go on. Go I, had, I had some rumination about this 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 morning. Um, uh, but there's there's a rabbi on the Jordan Peterson Exodus videos whose name escapes me who um, uh, says with a certain confidence that the scripture is adverse to social justice, that there is just justice in the Bible. Now, uh, OK, that might be a little bit contentious, but I think what he's trying to highlight here is that the scripture doesn't discriminate um in terms of sin and injustice as to who's doing it that you know the poor man and the rich can e equally be up for for judgment now what does this mean in terms of immigration well i i say a lot of progressive theology proposes the ideas simply on you know some of the uh levitical and other texts which say we should welcome we should welcome the stranger the wanderer the 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 amorite so to speak into our into our communities and we should be hospitable and that is true you know uh that those texts are are there um but the other the flip side of that is the scripture is also very strong in terms of that you know if you join the the nation the holy nation uh you are also bound by by its laws uh and to be respectful of the practices um and to uh to contribute uh, to that that society uh mm. in a way that that recognizes where its culture is coming from you know that we're not going to change the torah for you this is it that mm. you come into us and we will we will make certain provisions but our expectations uh, is is this you know then in essence you become one of us mm. uh and um that side to that what the scripture is saying is is rarely said about and i suppose the other dimension to that is that the, the scriptures are clearly very allergic to um you know sort of syncretic culture by that i mean that you know a culture which um uh says you know well we go back to this word postmodern all truths lead to the lead us up to the mount same mountain because you know we see that in the way that um the israelites were clearly traumatized by what the canaanites were doing mm. you know in terms of uh their, their their idolatry and sacrifice and the worship of baal and what have you you know that and and they saw that as part of the the north south eventual schism that happens is that when the the you know kings after solomon start um uh, start taking pagan practices things things fall apart you know so they're very keen on a you know a, a cohesive culture that gathers around jehovah yahweh mm. uh and you know it, if you're going to immigrate into uh god's people then then are we will be hospitable but we have certain expectations mm. you're going to have to uh not only just you know sort of do the bare minimum but we expect you to be part of celebrating who we are and what we have been mm. so you know i think there is actually a very strong argument to say uh that just you know uh, allowing all and sundry to come into our to have no borders mm. um it is not a biblical position no so, you, yeah. some will say that it is Mm. yeah i mean i i think that that's all very well said daniel and um i think it's definitely a, a a scriptural position to believe in the legitimacy of nations you know i mean in the book of acts for example the apostle paul talks about the way that god has established boundaries and uh nations for people to live in and it just seems to me on a on an evidential level that 
uh, on a sort of on the level of experience that nations are real. They're they're real things. They're not just arbitrary um, land masses, uh, but they actually consist of cultures. You know, um, different languages, different um, uh, artistic mm. and aesthetic sensibilities, different um, customs, uh, different types of food you know all, all that kind of stuff uh, you know these are these are real things nations so unless unless you don't believe in the legitimacy of nations uh you have to have some kind of immigration policy be that um formal or, or informal about who comes in and, and who doesn't and upon what criteria so i mean if you think about the thing with our country and the 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 the, the channel crossings for example um, some people will say, well, we have to accept everybody who comes over the channel as an I- illegal immigrant as an act of Christian charity. And I think that's probably what, you know, people like the bishop, uh, the archbishop and other bishops would say. Uh, but then there'll be other people who would say, well, hang on a second. Um, these people are already in France. You know, France isn't that bad a country. Uh, we have our own problems here, which are which are aided by immigration Um and there are people who are trying to emigrate into this country le- legally uh, who should have priority. And we can't, you know, there are, we have to also protect people who live in our country and also provide for them. And you have to think about the social consequences of what happened when you just allow um, undocumented I- illegal immigrants to, to, to come over the channel into a country. One of which, which is an obvious one, is that they provide cheap labor. So it alienates the the uh, the poor in our in our country who are already here who, who perhaps have jobs at the moment or who are looking for jobs but won't have those jobs if if um if undocumented um workers come into our country who are prepared to work for less less money there's similar things you could say about housing and other other things like schooling so you know it's a very idealistic view in my in my opinion to just say well we should just have you know no borders and no immigration uh, because it doesn't take into account any of these um more um s- complex social considerations and and the other thing i just say as well daniel is that there is a difference between the the message of say the good samaritan which is really about our individual response to the needs of people who god has placed around us in our lives you know the things which i'm called to do as an individual there is a difference between what you're called to do as an individual and what governments are called to do in terms of governing and ruling their nations and there may be some overlap but it's not really the, it's not really the same thing in my opinion that that question about the good samaritan that's mm. um that's about that's about the question of who is my neighbor isn't it and mm. and that that to me is an individual question it, it is more complicated at that kind of governmental level yeah de- de- definitely um and i think we we would find if we interrogated the um you know a, a lot of data on this that um People in, say, like the Windrush communities, um, people who've come over from uh, Asia and India are actually quite conservative, too, about this question. Right. Uh, And surprise, you know, that 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 surprisingly, surprisingly so, um, because they understand um, what is needed in terms to assimilate is quite a serious thing. And then, you know, uh, and a large part of um, that immigrant community over the last two three generations uh, have made very big sacrifices to get here mm. and they know that it's a serious it's a serious thing um and often i've i've found this um both in like muslim and hindu communities for instance that often they want us to be that they want us to be bold in our christianity mm. Which of course the secular people find the secular progressives find very embarrassing and you know something that they want to cough cough and not talk about. But they'll say, no, you know, you, you Christians need to be bold about the faith because this is good for all, you know, and um that they'll they'll see the the, the benefits of Christian society. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> and we we tend to imagine we, we're told in our, you know, our PHSE and GCSE curriculums, quite the opposite. Mm. Um, that you know that we need a, a culture uh, where uh, all truths just hang, and in the end, none do. You know, and mm. I think this is what you know the, the rabbis and the imams kind of understand that you actually need one dominant re- religion, na- religious narrative, for for society to hang its transcendent truths on. Mm. 
um, and they don't mind actually if that's you know they don't mind that bishops are in the in the House of Lords, um, and whereas you know the, the 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 humanists will will play out as if this is causing great offence. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, and I and I don't think I don't think for a minute that these co- that these people would mind if the coronation is overtly Christian, for instance. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it doesn't need to be a multicultural mishmash, which mm. hope won't be. But you know, I think it is going to be. <laughs> yeah, let's hope not. I don't know. Were you on the podcast when we 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 covered this uh, Prince Charles's plans? I don't think you were. It's a few weeks ago. It doesn't. It doesn't sound the 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 signs are not good. Um, uh, Daniel, I hate I hate to break it to you, but yeah, no, I I agree with that. I think you know you have to have an immigration policy, and the immigration policy just has to take in loads of different factors and of course you want to be generous of course you want to help people but at the same time you have to um you have to uh help the people who live in your nation as well and and uh, my, for them. i um you know my adopted mother my grandmother was from belgium where you know yeah. I, i'm second generation immigrant from, yeah. from continental europe um, I that, yeah so so you know you, you understand my first language is french yeah yeah. yeah, I I understand that, it, but it's a it's a I think it's a, it's a big and serious investment to mm-hmm. to emigrate, and having no borders seems to sort of make us citizens of nowhere. Yeah, well, it's 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 just a fantasy, isn't it? It's John yeah. Lennon's it's John Lennon's imagine. You know, it's like let's have no countries. And hang on a second, countries are real things. If you take away people's countries, you take away their identity, you take away their traditions, you take away their sense of who they are, and it ends in disaster. And you could see this happening in in multiple ways in our country with this fantasy of multiculturalism, which is 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 just is just a word for this the same thing. It, you you can't have you know, all cultures existing in the same place at the same time. That's not how a culture works. By its very definition, a culture is exclusive of other cultures and not in a bad way. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you're racist or anything like that. It's just that there is a certain thing that characterizes your culture. There's a language which people speak, for example. You know, there is there are customs that that, that you have which are which are mutually exclusive with other types of customs. It's just it's just silly to sort of say that this stuff can all all come come together. It's it's um it's just not how it's just not how human society works. And why would you want it to be anyway? When you go, you know, I love uh, going on holiday to France. I haven't been for for a long time, but I love French culture. I wouldn't want French culture to be completely multicultural. I want to go over there and I want to eat their food, you know, which is delicious. I want to have a, a croissant. I want to hear the French language being spoken. You know, I want to see <laughs> French French films on 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 TV. I want I want them to drive on a different to continue to drive on the different side of the the road to me and to have different uh, speed limits uh, on their on their on their roads and you know all this all this kind of stuff you go on and on and on about it forever but what would it mean for it to be really multicultural it would just mean that mm. everywhere would be the same and why why does anyone want that what's the appeal mm. So that's my view, Daniel. And we've been going for ages. This is a monster podcast. I hope people really feel like they've got their um, money's worth. Daniel, let's do a prayer. You're going to do the... Uh, yeah, I'm going to do two prayers. One, some people who went to... Those who went to our podcast live event will have got their... Will have their green card. And on the back of that is the prayer of St. Ignatius. And I just invite you, if you have the card, you might want to say it along with us or... Mm. Um, if you don't, it's it's something that we can. Um, it's easy to get hold of. Maybe we could put it in the show notes. Mm. But it's, um, its opening line is "Take, Lord, receive." So let us pray. Take, Lord, receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my whole will, all that I have, all that I possess. You gave it all to me, Lord. I give it all back to you. Do with it as you will according to your good pleasure. Give me your love and your grace, for with this I have all that I need. And then this is the collect from Ash Wednesday, which is a prayer that we can say throughout Lent. And here I'm using the 1662 prayer book. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, Create and make in us new and contrite hearts 
that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and sacrifice and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for your time today. I, I think this has been a, a good episode. And uh, if you agree and you'd like to support us, please do go to our website, revenpod.com, and you can see how you can support us, become a monthly supporter on Patreon, or leave us, um, buy us a coffee and leave us a little message on buy me a coffee. There's a big red button. There's a big yellow button. So please do go ahead and do that if you'd like to support the podcast. And I do really appreciate that because soon I'm taking a part-time job. And as part of that part-time job, I'm going to be doing a bit more on the podcast and relying quite heavily on the income from the podcast. So it really does help if people do support the the podcast uh, now and in the future. Uh, but Daniel, thank you uh, for your time. Good to see you. And uh, see, see you again Jamie. Soon. Okay. All right. Well, goodbye now. And um, thanks to everyone for listening. And we'll be with you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.